Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Crossroads of Ideas. My name is Laura Heisler and I'm Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Director of Outreach for the Mortgage Institute for Research and a partner with the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And these three organizations collaborate to bring you this series once each month during the academic year, along with our new media partner, The Cap Times. Before we get started this evening, I want to um, mention that we have another episode coming up in April on April 20th. You'll wanna mark your calendars. That one's gonna take place at 7 p.m. And if you got an email for this, this edition of Crossroads, you'll get one for that one as well. We'll be talking about Earth Day in the context of climate change and how it affects uh, underserved communities and uh, how we all can collaborate to, to deal with the impacts of climate change. So more to come on that. Um, before getting started tonight, I do want to acknowledge the land that UW-Madison and WARP occupy and recognize that these organizations occupy ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison and Wharf respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. And now it is my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator, Jason Joyce from the Cap Times, who will introduce our amazing panel of leaders and scientists who are dealing with vaccine, uh, Wisconsin's vaccine rollout. Jason, over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, this discussion comes at an interesting time today. If your group of friends and family is anything like mine, uh, people close to you are getting the vaccine now. These vaccine selfies are starting to show up places. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, perspective looking back at the last 12 months to see that maybe we're finally here, right? Um, people are making birthday party plans of all things. Uh, dare I say there's some optimism in the air along with the arrival of spring, which is fantastic to feel. Uh, with our panel today, we'll be talking about where we are uh, with the vaccine rollout, what we've learned from the last 12 months, and how university researchers have helped play important roles in determining public health policy and vaccine distribution uh, strategies. Joining me today are uh, Nasia Safdar. Uh, she's a professor of infectious disease with the University of Wisconsin's Department of Medicine. Jonathan Tempty, who is the Associate Dean for Public Health and Community Engagement at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Michael Ferris is a professor of computer sciences and the director of the Data Sciences Hub at the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery. Myron Livney is a professor of computer sciences and principal scientist at Core Computational Technology of the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery. And Malia Jones is an associate scientist with the University of Wisconsin's Applied Population Laboratory. She's also one of the quote, nerdy girls who created Dear Pandemic, a source of real info on COVID-19. Welcome to all of you. We'll start today with uh, Nasia Safdar. Way back in April, in an interview with the Wisconsin State Journal, you were asked your biggest concern with the coronavirus at that point. And you said, asking the questions, are interventions like the safer at home order enough? For how long will those need to be continued? Can we get the necessary buy-in to continue them until we either have a vaccine or this sort of peters out on its own? 11 to 12 months later, COVID-19 clearly did not go away on its own, but people are getting vaccinated and the mood in many places is optimistic. What is your assessment of how Wisconsin has done over these last 12 months? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think Wisconsin has expended a lot of effort, a lot of energy, and a lot of resources, as was important, to be able to put into place and retain into place the interventions that are non-pharmaceutical in nature, but are so critical to blunting the curve for SARS-CoV-2. And those are, of course, the distancing and the masking. And how we did over the year, you know, I think they were ebbs and flows, as was expected. There were certainly a lot of challenges that the state had to go through and is still um, going through even as uh, the mood gets better and vaccinations roll out. But I think the spirit of collaboration was unprecedentedly high in this pandemic, and that has helped us all 
come together in a way that we can really maximize our recovery from what transpired. Jonathan Tempty, uh, a significant concern of the coronavirus is that it does not affect all populations equitably. Uh, for a variety of reasons, some populations have been more likely to contract the virus, feel its effects more acutely, and even more likely to die from it. Uh, we've heard that distribution of the vaccine is intended to address those inequities. Are these priority priorities introduced to you as scientists from policymakers? Are you hearing um, about these concerns from leaders and officials, or uh, do you have a voice on the social issues uh, coming to the table as advisors? Well, thank you so much, uh, Jason. Really important question. And <clears throat> taking a step back before I answer it, as with almost everything in medicine, there are huge disparities based on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and so on. And as you mentioned, we're finding great disparities in terms of cases, hospitalization, and death. For example, in our state of Wisconsin, uh, our Native American population has two times the hospitalization rate and one and a half times the death rate of our white population. And across the entire United States, over, this, over the first six months of the pandemic, people on average lost a year of their life expectancy. Uh, but that wasn't equal. Uh, black men lost three years. Black women, 2.3 years. Latinx men, 2.4 years. So we just have to keep in mind, these are re really important. But you were asking, you know, uh, do policymakers and the scientists, it's actually the other way around. It's the scientists that inform the policymakers. I've had the pleasure of working with CDC on their advisory committee on immunization practices work group on COVID-19 vaccines. And the information coming from epidemiological studies emerged very early. So back in May and June, we were already talking about the disparities when we were starting to look at immunization policy. Uh, our work group helps to formulate policy options for the larger uh, advisory committee on immunization practices that form the recommendations, and then it goes to the policymakers. So uh, I think the important thing here is the science really kind of in the best situation will drive policy. Unfortunately, that isn't always how it works out. And I'll just finish up by saying there was just a paper out uh, a couple days ago in uh, the Mortality, uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report, that's the CDC journal, and indicates that the vaccine, since it started flowing, has flowed inequitably toward higher socioeconomic groups. Uh, and so we are maintaining this disparity despite all of our efforts to try and circumvent that. I want to get back to some aspects of that later. Um, I think we're experiencing that. Many of us are living that right now. Uh, Michael Ferris, based on some measures, the CDC had Wisconsin near the bottom of its ranking of states by efficacy of administering vaccines earlier this year. Uh, but that's changed in recent weeks, and the state now ranks near the top, certainly in the Midwest region. Uh, is it fair to look at those fairly simple numbers uh, as a way to measure efficacy, uh, meaning like population, just raw population, percentage of population that's received the vaccine. Um, and second, how did that improvement happen? So, so maybe if I could answer your second question first, I think that, that a major factor in how to improve the efficiency uh, or the efficacy was uh, to build models that, that looked at allocation uh, logistics and, and built real models that actually showed us how to generate uh, a, an appropriate allocation and distribution across the state. And so I think the change is uh, looking at how uh, we can use such mathematical models over the past uh, 10 to 15 weeks to, to essentially get the, the doses to the right places so that we can get them into to the people's arms. However, coming back to your first question, uh, there is this issue that, that John has already mentioned, and, and that's the fact that, that while a lot of these measures, which we are now doing very well in, are about getting the proportion of uh, doses uh, that have been delivered to Wisconsin 
into people's arms. It's clear that that alone is not the, the thing that we should be striving for. And so uh, I'd like to talk about uh, 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 what we struggle with in our models or how to build measures of fairness within those models. And so those could include uh, underserved populations. They could couldn't, uh, uh, consider vulnerable populations. And to some extent, our models uh, have to build surrogates or some different metrics to actually measure those. And so um, what I'd like to finish with uh, is just that those simple numbers about doses in arms isn't enough. We have to strive to get to, uh, as many of the vaccines into the right arms as possible, as well as, uh, as uh, a full coverage as much as we can do. Myron Livney, uh, your work as a computer scientist uh, puts you in touch with uh, many members of the university scientific community, many members of the just the scientific community at large uh, in several different areas of research, including some Nobel Prize winners. Uh, what is unique for you as a computer scientist about this particular challenge? So uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to tell you about what uh, we have been doing. So we uh, have been trying to put together the computing, the storage, and the automation uh, that is needed by researchers to, to do their work. You heard from Michael about their models. So some, somebody has to run and compute these models, and they are coming up with a lot of them, and the more they can run, the better off they are. So we are used for them to come knock at the door. But typically, they don't have the urgency that we experience uh, now dealing with the, the, the COVID uh, situation. So we had to deal with how can we get them the results as quickly as possible, and how can we create an infrastructure that is dependable, that when they have to do it uh, today and tomorrow and the day after that, there are no hiccups. And that, that was a challenge. I believe we, we did uh, pretty well. Uh, Michael has not been running after me with any dangerous uh, sticks so far. But uh, it, yes, we worked on it. But that was really new for us. And just today, we got a request from the, the CDC saying, we have some data. We need help with processing it. We, and we are already working on it. I don't know when we'll have it all running. But that's the kind of thing. We have, there are people in the loop. There are important mess, a decision that needs to be made. And we have to make sure that the back end does what it needs to do. Malia Jones, in establishing Dear Pandemic and your outreach work 12 months ago, you were focused on the very basics of what a pandemic is and does, how we should change our practical decision making, whether we should still pick our nose, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, it, how to protect ourselves and our communities and our families. How has the emergence of the vaccine um, with people we know receiving it, people in our communities, wondering what to do once they have it. Uh, how has it changed your job in that respect? Yeah. Um, you know, a year ago, I set out to provide the, the kind of really practical, grounded, honest advice to the people I love. And in many ways, that's still exactly what I'm doing at Dear Pandemic. Um, our core mission is to educate and empower people to navigate the overwhelming amount of information that's coming at us from every direction during the pandemic. And the emergence of vaccines has just set off a new phase in how we need to navigate. Um, there are all these new guidelines, new questions, and most especially, there is a lot of new misinformation and really targeted disinformation about the vaccines themselves. So we're now spending a lot of our time answering questions about the vaccines, but they still focus on those really practical, grounded uh, questions like, what are the side effects? How can I prepare for my vaccine appointment? 
Um, how do I talk to someone who isn't so sure about the vaccines? You know, what's true and what's not true? What are the guidelines coming out of CDC about what I can do after I'm vaccinated and how am I supposed to interpret these? Um, so yeah, the vaccines are new, but I think our need to understand how to apply all of the new information that is uh, continues to, to flow in and figure out how to um, use it in our daily lives in a way that's scientifically grounded is just as high. And so there is this real ongoing need to understand uh, and communicate about the vaccines and also about this idea that, you know, there is a lot of hope and I think we're coming out of the woods, but we're really not there yet. There's still a lot of uncertainty about what the next couple of months look like. And, um, you know, we need people to sort of stay the course on these mitigation measures so that we can um, resolve the pandemic as the vaccines roll out. Um, after having just processed and dealt with questions now for so many months, I'm sure every manner of question on this pandemic has come through you. Are you encouraged by the uh, just the kinds of questions people have and the way they refer to these these health issues, maybe an evolution of, of how they discuss these issues? Yes and no. I mean, it's been really interesting as a researcher, you know, I'm not primarily a communications person, or at least I wasn't a year ago. Um, and as a researcher, it's been really interesting to see what the questions are. I think that that I have learned a lot and, and the Dear Pandemic team has grown and learned a lot about how to communicate. Um, but the questions are actually very similar to questions that we were getting right at the beginning. And uh, that speaks to the fact that, you know, lots of people have have the same questions and there is a real gap between, you know, for example, what the CDC guidance says and the, the really practical um, minutia of applying that guidance to your daily life. So just for example, this past week, we had um, one of our most popular essays ever was was giving some examples of how you might think about a, a family yep. where the parents are fully vaccinated and the kids are not. You know, that's something that's not in the CDC guidance explicitly, and it's something people are really struggling with. That's great. Uh, Michael, could you tell us a little bit about how the University of Wisconsin, the community that you're working in, has been involved in the state's rollout strategy um, and maybe touch on how your research in particular um, is playing a role uh, as we go along. Uh, so, so we have been engaged with uh, the university. The university has been engaged with DHS uh, for a long time, starting uh, way back in last February and March, uh, talking about how to use modeling and data-driven tools to actually address issues, primarily uh, from my research, uh, issues about scarce resource allocation. Uh, first of all, there were issues about hospital beds and uh, equipment and, and stuff like that. But, but more recently, um, university researchers directly engaged within a team uh, that incorporates people from both the DHS, the Department of Health Services, the National Guard, and also the, 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 the state uh, legislature. Uh, we think about... Um, uh, methods for actually de developing uh, allocations uh, for these models. And so each week uh, uh, we solve a model which is just really a balancing of supply and demand. All of the multitude of uh, vaccinators or hospitals, clinics and, and pharmacies uh, fill in a survey that actually detail uh, the, the, the requests for vaccines. And that all comes and collects, uh, gets collected centrally and some additional information processing, which talks about how many of those vaccines are serving underrepresented populations, how much of those vaccines are going outside of a county. Uh, all of those kinds of information are then processed. And I get this great big stack of data that then comes in and then I solve the supply, uh, supply demand uh, quest uh, question as uh, well as I can. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Greg Engel, uh, turned around and said, uh, oh, you did, he said one week, he said, you did a really great job with that allocation and nobody is satisfied. Uh, and the key point is that, that it, this is really very much uh, a limited supply issue. 
And so uh, there are lots of requests for uh, demands. There are lots of people who are um, needing to have these to serve different types of population. Uh, and we have to struggle with how to balance all of those different things uh, whilst maintaining some fairness of the allocation. And so my research constrained optimization, how to do that in uh, better ways, is a tool that uh, helps decision makers make decisions. The tool itself doesn't make the decisions, but it aids decision makers in making better decisions about that allocation. Myron, your work um, speaks to some of that as well in that um, you could be doing a great job as a computer scientist, um, you know, really groundbreaking stuff. But if if maybe the, the information that comes out of that research is distasteful to the public or or to other stakeholders, it, it's, uh, it doesn't reflect well, I guess. Do you dwell on that as a scientist? Or are these things that you're aware of sort of the, you know, society is discussing this problem much more than many of the other things that you work on? Yes, but uh, we get our motivation and satisfaction by enabling Michael, who can uh, enable the decision maker. And I think it's, it's important for everyone to understand that science today is multi-layered. And they, uh, they are the one at the front that make the decisions that are visible to the public, but there are many layers underneath it that enable them to make what we hope is the best decision. So we, we are satisfied and we are very happy to make uh, the Michaels of the world happy and others on campus. And then not worry about who Michael makes happy with his op uh, wonderful optimization work. So I, I think this is something that uh, not everyone appreciates, that if we don't deal with this supply chain of capabilities, then we cannot do things at the top and everyone has to contribute to it, definitely on the computation. I, I'm sure it's true for other domains, but uh, what I say is uh, applicable to, to the computing that we do. Nasia, we've talked a little bit about collaboration here. And uh, again, you know, often you've been in a role as a public facing uh, member of the UW scientific community. Um, is there a, a balance to be drawn um, between sharing the research, sharing what we know, um, but also in, in, during a pandemic, advising people, and in some cases telling people what they don't wanna hear, which is they're doing things incorrectly or they need to be more responsible? Thank you for that question. I think the principles that most of us try to adhere to, you know, you want to be accurate, you want to be concise and you always want to consider the audience. If you're speaking to the public, it is important that subject matter experts really try to interpret the data in a way that the public can easily understand rather than relying on potential misinformation that can happen through multiple channels. Whenever feasible, I think if you're asking the public to engage in behaviors that are not easy to sustain, I think you want to be positive about the why behind those behaviors and why it's important to do that and for how long. But it is equally important to be candid about the things that we don't know. I think one of the most humbling things about COVID has been that, you know, we thought we were treating it as an acute infectious diseases, respiratory condition. You get sick for a while, you recover. Um, and, and that's sort of a very finite time frame. But in fact, what we're learning now is that many, many people will have symptoms for several months after that. Uh, and no one had any clue about that until these reports started coming out. So I think acknowledging that there's much we still don't know, there's a lot we're learning, uh, but then I think ultimately our allegiance is to the truth. Jonathan, are, in that same vein, I, I think scientists uh, at times like these are often called upon to make predictions. I mean, I wanna know when, then you know, when, if I'll be able to go to my kid's middle school band concert or, well, maybe not that, but um, a nightclub, you know, a, a concert at a nightclub or something like that. Are those fair questions to ask of you and other scientists? They are always fair questions to ask. 
Uh, I'm not sure how fair it is of us to try and give a, an answer that is too prescriptive. I think from very early on, this is new ground from us. Uh, I've given a talk now on the pathway to pandemic's end, and I've described that the, I, I use pathway as opposed to highway because we haven't been over this way before. We don't know what's around the next quarter. We don't know what the destination looks like. Uh, and this is really pretty challenging. On the flip side, I have to say that one of my very favorite articles uh, looking at epidemiology of this virus came out in mid-April last year. And this is done by some very good epidemiologists. And in my mind, they just nailed things correctly because they looked at the biological nature of other coronaviruses. They looked at seasonality, they looked at human behavior, and they made some very, very, very good predictions that indicated if we were very intense with our distancing, masking, and so on, uh, we could stave things off for a while at the risk of things coming back very intensely in the fall. And that's in fact what happened. So I think it's really difficult to make really good predictions, but you can make educated guesses. And I think uh, all of us sitting around here uh, on this virtual discussion night, try to do our best job of making guesses, making statements based on good, solid scientific grounding, uh, and also admitting that sometimes we will be wrong. And that's part of the scientific process, the possibility and oftentimes the likelihood that you don't get it right. Malia, how much of science and being a scientist at a time like this is indeed teaching the public about what science means and the study of science? This has been a, a major theme at Dear Pandemic um, is, is trying to address um, the need for, for some scientific literacy and some infectious disease epi 100 kind of education. Um, and one of the things that we really focus on is the idea that um, science is not a set of truths. It's, science is a process. And we continue to evolve, you know, especially in this context where we started off knowing almost nothing. We continue to evolve our information all the time. Every day we learn something new about COVID-19. And um, it's really important for us to be transparent about what we do and we don't know now. And transparent about the fact that we, um, we will learn something new tomorrow. So today's conclusions uh, can be very quickly outdated. Um, and, you know, I was, I was sort of laughing, uh, listening to John talk about pred making predictions. It's been a very humbling experience to realize just how hard it is to predict what's coming next when there is so much uncertainty. Um, as a matter of fact, I've started keeping an eight ball on my desk just to remind myself that um, it's very hard to predict <laughs> what's coming next when there's so much, uh, so much at stake and so many different factors changing. We keep we keep hearing that day back, you know, a year ago when Anthony Fauci, you know, said, I don't think people need to wear masks. I mean, he's going to wear that for a long time from, I think, people who don't understand that science is a process. Um, that's an excellent point. I want to get into a little bit of the ethics of, of uh, seeking vaccines, because I think that's a reality in our community right now. And it speaks to a lot of the different threads that, that we've brought up already this afternoon. Uh, Nasia, I'm wondering if you can speak to this um, just from a, a perspective of trying to get vaccines out to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, should we as individuals be making these calls to Walgreens or trying to you know, get in line, even if our group isn't isn't up at this point? How should we be approaching this? You know, I think we wouldn't have to make these decisions if supply was adequate. So the only reason the vaccines need to be prioritized the way that they're being allocated is because we don't have enough supply. So trying to undercut that supply by calling and making an appointment when you're not within the group that is at highest risk for complications doesn't seem like the best citizenship type thing to do. Now, having said that, there will be circumstances when 
um, there will be missed appointments or the possibility that parts of a vaccine or vials might be wasted. And, you know, it, the most important thing is that the vaccine should be put into arms. And so if there's a chance that something could be wasted and you don't have any option but to give it to someone who is not otherwise eligible, I would say, you know, proceed accordingly. But people certainly should not, obviously, you know, it should go without saying, but one shouldn't lie or cheat your way to the front of the line. Michael Ferris, uh, how does this, um, I, I don't want to call it a scramble, but uh, people definitely are talking about this now. How does that factor into your work in terms of distribution? So, so uh, it, 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 what, what we work at is uh, to try and understand what are, are the appropriate changes uh, in, in terms of the people who are being prioritized at any one time. And I think that, that firstly, you don't want to uh, waste scarce resources, as Nasia so eloquently said. Uh, but secondly, you, what you want to make sure is that the right uh, resources are there at the time when people need them. And so there are lots of uh, underrepresented uh, uh, places or uh, people who uh, have, uh, are at higher risk of the disease. And what we want to make sure in our allocation model is for the fairness is that we ensure that uh, an appropriate number of vaccines are actually delivered to those locations. And so in the model, there are these surrogates. So there's surrogates for fairness. So mathematically, I, I just deal with numbers and equations. So we have to build up a, a surrogate for what does uh, fairness mean. And so that's uh, a really an interesting thing about uh, mathematics and this interaction with the social sciences, scientists is how do you actually incorporate into a mathematical model all of these uh, intangible social aspects and all the aspects about uh, uncertainties that come from uh, us not being able to predict human behavior, uh, either vaccine searching or uh, not wanting to take a vaccine or whatever the different uh, uh, idiosyncrasies of our human behavior and how do you actually build surrogates in a mathematical model to account for that. That's what's challenging me. That's what's fun. That's a really great research topic. And that'll last way beyond uh, COVID-19 because it's so relevant for lots of other decision processes as well. That, that, that's what keeps me uh, working all hours of the day and night. Yeah. Jonathan, can you speak to this? Is it a, uh, I, I know that there are some people who just believe, boy, we need to get to that herd immunity number. As many people as can we can get that shot into now need to be just out there waiting in line. Yeah. You know, the, the big challenge is really getting to, who will create the most benefit if we vaccinate? And the quick answer is nobody knows. Uh, it's really, really difficult. The mod, I've, I've spent since last May weekly, sometimes twice a week, uh, conferences with CDC, uh, seeing the best modeling being done. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm willing to confess that when you look at do we immunize old people? Do we immunize people who are working? Do we immunize people who have high risk medical conditions? And according to the modelers, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. When you take a step further and you start asking the question, should I immunize somebody who is likely not to acquire this because they have been safe and are not likely to spread it, or should I be immunizing somebody who's young, mobile, and likely to spread this to four or five other people? Where should I go? And we just don't have those answers. So uh, at the end of the day, we, we live with a lot of uncertainty. So I, I think uh, if you take it a step further, it's really important to get as much vaccine out to as many people as possible. And I think I'm trying to get back to your original question, Jason. We want to try and get up to what's called this herd immunity threshold. And we don't quite know what that is. Our best guess originally was that was somewhere around 60%, 65% based on how transmittable this virus is. But then we had the wild card thrown in by these other 
variants of concern. You've heard of the B117 strain out of the UK, which might be as much as 1.4 or 1.5 times more transmissible. Well, what that does is it forces that herd immunity threshold upward. So now we're looking at maybe 80%. Uh, so at the end of the day, what's really, really important is to get as much vaccine out as quickly as possible to try and slow everything down with a hope that we do eventually get up to that 80% uh, immunity either obtained through infection and recovery or more prefer preferentially uh, vaccination. Uh, the good news right now is we're now getting 2.5 million doses of vaccine per day in the United States. The bad news is we're doing terribly in the rest of the world. And this is a global pandemic and it's experienced by everybody across the entire planet. And so until we have kind of this global equity, we're still gonna be uh, having some significant problems out there. Malia, how do we uh, learn uh, from this process of, you know, not just vaccine distribution, but the, the way people communicate to each other about, about getting their vaccine? How, how do we learn from this to make sure that next time is better? Yeah, um, well, one of the things that um, there's been a lot of attention to, you know, as the especially through the anniversary of when the the pandemic first came to the United States is, you know, what what are the takeaways? What are the big lessons learned here? And I do hope that one of our big takeaways here is that we 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 need a playbook for the next pandemic, and I think it should include a plan for national vaccine distribution in a crisis. Um, this is, it's been, you know, tremendously challenging to distribute, um, allocate, and uh, actually just make an appointment for a vaccine. And I know people are very frustrated about it because they tell me every day. And uh, I hope that one of our takeaways is that we need to plan, make a plan to, uh, you know, smooth that road for the next time. Um, more generally, you know, communications about the pandemic. I think um, as science, as a scientific community, we have learned a tremendous amount uh, about the need for uh, scientific literacy and for, for citizens to just engage with the scientific um, advice that's out there in a way that's critically thinking and helpful for public health. And I actually have a lot of hope that... Um, you know, words like herd immunity, herd immunity is what I, my little niche area of science that I've been studying for years. And now it's like dinner table conversation. So I, I think we've all learned a lot about infectious disease. And I, I think that that could be helpful going forward to the next, uh, to the next pandemic. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions coming in and I just want to encourage uh, those of you who are watching uh, to to enter your questions in the comments uh, because we will we would love to hear your questions we'd love to address those um, and we'll be we'll be getting to uh, to audience questions here in, in just a bit um, I just wanted to go back to that that herd immunity uh, point again and how how much you know random you know people are are seemingly uh, experts on it we we understand these things. Uh, now that we that we never used to, um, Jonathan, without asking you to make a prediction, um, how are we doing on our way to to herd immunity? Um, it, do you think we're heading in the right direction? How much of an alteration do we need to make in in our habits here? I think we're absolutely heading in the right direction. Uh, the really good news, uh, and Malia can probably comment on this. But if you just watch that epidemic curve, the number of cases per day, and when it's going down slope, it means that on average, each person is transmitting to less than one new person. That's a good thing. So for whatever reason, we're on this down slope. It could be seasonal. It could be an awful lot of the people who are spreading have already come down with this. And, uh, you know, some of the power is out of the epidemic. And part of it absolutely is the fact that we're putting out so much vaccine right now. Uh, the hope is, and the projections are that by about midsummer, um, 
July sometime, that we probably are going to hit that percentage point, which we call herd immunity. That's a theoretical construct. Um, we, we think it should work. Uh, this will be a really good test for that. What I can assure you, though, is we know it works beautifully with measles. Measles is the most transmittable infectious disease out there. And to maintain, uh, as the United States has since 2000, you know, 21 years, uh, we have maintained the elimination of measles here by having a herd immunity up around 93, 94%. And we, we know this works. We're just not quite sure what level we need to be with SARS-CoV-2, but we do know it's probably higher than 40%. We know it's probably less than that 90%, but we're gonna get there. And my fingers are really, really crossed uh, that we, we get there as soon as possible. Nasia Safdar, what are the dangers here? Where are the pitfalls as we have a population that is partially vaccinated, but increasingly so now, seemingly every day? Well, I think the, the good news here is that, you know, if the vaccine supply continues to improve and we have more access to a single dose vaccine, then that process can be accelerated even more so than, than what is happening now. I think the challenges that will happen at, at some point already are there is to what extent will people embrace the vaccine. Uh, we're already hearing about some that are in, in a considerable proportion that for you know uh, sometimes very good reasons are unwilling to commit themselves to a vaccine. And then there's an entirely uh, different subgroup of the population that despite wanting to cannot get the vaccine because they have an allergic reaction to the components of the vaccine or, or some other medical reason for not being able to get it. And so I think those groups will still be vulnerable, but to the extent that we can, those barriers have to be addressed and removed so that ultimately we want to get to a place where everybody that is eligible for a vaccine should be able to get it at a time and place of their choosing that's convenient to them without having to do a lot of running around to find a place where they can get it. Uh, Malia Jones, people are now posting photos of, you know, grand, parents hugging their grandchildren for the first time in years. Are there some things, are, are there some cautionary words that you have for the general public? Well, yeah, I, I um, so I'm a little less optimistic than John about the, our ability to reach herd immunity this summer. Um, and a lot of that is because, um, you know, we don't have a vaccine for kids yet. And uh, kids make up about 20% of our population here in Wisconsin, 24% nationally. Um, we're also seeing uh, something of like 20 to 25% of the adult population who says they have no intention of getting vaccinated. And I don't really think we can get to herd immunity without one of those two groups getting into the pool. Um, and so unless a lot of the adults who have some uh, hesitancy about getting vaccinated change their minds over these next few months, and we can, uh, as Nasia pointed out, uh, improve access and reduce those barriers for the people who want to be vaccinated but can't, um, you know, it's a long road to herd immunity. I actually think we're going to be in, in some other in-between phase for a while here where um, we are still we still need to wear masks and have some behavioral changes in order to control the pandemic. But, um, but slowly things will start to feel more normal and we'll be able to, to, you know, hug, have our kids hugging our grandparents. Um, the specific words of caution that I would say is that, um, you know, the, the CDC guidelines for fully vaccinated people are, um, are a little hard to interpret in a way that's very practical uh, and just to figure out, okay, is it safe for me to be face-to-face -face with um, this group of people indoors without masks on? And I would say just err on the side of caution. One of the real pitfalls seems to be lack of understanding that you can't have um, unvaccinated kids from more than one household face-to-face -face without masks on because they're on kids are unvaccinated people. Um, Another pitfall is that travel is still not recommended and uh, that children are actually, uh, although they do very, you know, by and large, they do better than adults when they get COVID-19, they are not immune to COVID-19. 
So those are some of the specific pitfalls. Um, the CDC guidance is complex and uh, it's really a challenge to interpret it for your everyday, you know, to figure out how, how am I going to do this um, upcoming uh, anniversary celebration with, with Gramps and Grandma? Nasia, I think that when we talk about hesitancy, uh, many of us in a community like Madison, which is very highly educated, we tend to think that, well, people just don't, they're not informed. They, they don't, um, you know, that maybe their, their level of education isn't high enough to understand why vaccinations are important, or perhaps they're politically opposed. Are there other reasons for people to be hesitant? And um, maybe which, which uh, type of hesitancy is more difficult to overcome? Well, I think there's a whole range of reasons why people can be hesitant. But I think one thing is clear that you cannot argue people with people for them to come around to your point of view. You have to understand what their reasons for those hesitancy are and then address them to the best of your ability. And with that approach, there are some who will be persuaded to change their opinion. And there are others who, for whatever reason, will, will not be uh, changing their mind. Um, and I would focus on the people that potentially are in a place where they're open to hearing about the benefits of the vaccine, what it might do for you, uh, what the reasons are that you might want to get it. And, and in those conversations, we've seen that some of the reasons people bring up are, you know, I'm a member of an underrepresented minority. How many people like me were in those trials? And how can you tell me about how the vaccine does for people like me? And so for those of us in epi and infectious diseases and vaccine development and allocation, you want to be really well aware of that data so that you can then provide an accurate picture. I think if you give a blanket statement, you know, the vaccine works great, you should take it. It doesn't always resonate with all groups in society because historically they have very good reasons to believe that that has not been the case. Jonathan, the, you know, the, the uh, process to approve these vaccines, of course, was sped up, but uh, how much research continues on them? How many trials are still ongoing and how much more are we learning about the, the ability of these vaccines to, you know, to answer some of the questions that, that Nasi just brought up? Having trouble getting off uh, the mute there. There uh, we go. Wonderful question. The thing people should understand is the second the vaccines were authorized by the FDA under the emergency use authorization, the safety apparatus kicked in to keep track of everything. The advisory committee, the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices through its work group on the COVID-19 vaccine, created a subgroup on safety. They also created a subgroup on monitoring the effectiveness of the vaccine after it was released. So to get to that authorization, you have to show through a randomized clinical trial, kind of the, the gold standard in the scientific world for measuring effectiveness of, of an intervention. To, to get to the authorization, the companies had to show that the vaccines were safe and safety is measured relative to other vaccines. And I'll, I'll just mention very quickly, vaccines are far safer than virtually any other medical intervention we have, far safer than the pharmaceutical agents, far safer than the surgical interventions, the medical devices and so on. But they had to meet certain criteria for safety. And I can say that these vaccines met that with flying colors and that part was not accelerated. Uh, the other part is to have this level of effectiveness and uh, those were met very quickly, but they have the benefit of operating the clinical trials during an upswing of a pandemic where it took very little time to acquire, unfortunately, people who were getting sick, either vaccinated or not. And it turns out that with both the mRNA vaccines, 95% of the time, those were blocking. But I think going forward, once you have that authorization, we do not turn off the safety mechanisms. We keep that going on. 
and on and on and on. And now, after there have been about 120, 130 million doses of vaccine in this country, we still don't see any significant safety signal. We've heard of about the one in 500,000 severe allergic reactions. But the outcomes of those have all actually been quite good. They've been recognized, they've been treated, and people do well. Of course, everybody will look for you know, the soreness, the fatigue, the fevers, and so on. And in fact, sometimes uh, people, when they get the second dose and don't get a significant response, worry that maybe the vaccine isn't working. Um, but I think that the bottom line is these have been incredibly safe and incredibly effective vaccines and performing much better than I hoped for back last summer and coming up into uh, use a whole lot quicker than any of us were expected. I'll just mention back last August, I was hoping that we would see the first vaccines become available, hopefully by spring or early summer of 2021. And I was fully expecting the vaccines to have a uh, effectiveness of about 60%, and they're 90, they're they're 95% for the mRNA, and uh, about 70% for the single dose Johnson Johnson. That vaccine is being studied for a second dose, and I can almost guarantee with the second dose, it's going to pull it on up to that higher level. But these have been really great vaccines, and 100% effective in preventing severe outcomes such as death and ICU. Uh, admission. So uh, really wonderful home runs so far for all three vaccines. Uh, one of the questions from the audience here is, uh, are antibody levels stable from the vaccines and how does that affect uh, herd immunity? Could you address that as well, Jonathan? Oh, certainly. Um, well, the, the quick answer is we don't know. The the first person to ever receive any of these vaccines um, has not had it in their system for more than you know about 10 months right now. And we never quite know with a new vaccine how long it's going to last for. For example, the uh, human papilloma virus vaccine, HPV, uh, has been wonderful. The, the durability has been so long and the response to the immune system so good to this vaccine that we've gone from routinely using three doses down to two doses. And people who are immunized, you know, in 2007, 2008 are still protected. There are other vaccines that we hope to last for a long time and they don't. And we have our annual influenza vaccine that we give annually because um, the virus changes significantly over that amount of time. And so We'll just have to wait until there's more and more data generated from people who are vaccinated and looking, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in these ongoing effectiveness trials to see after a certain amount of time, do people start having breakthrough cases? We hope not, but we'll see. And likewise, as uh, Dr. Safter can uh, mention, uh, we look at people who have had the disease and whether or not they're having recurrent disease or recurrent infection later on, uh, kind of a reinfection or a breakthrough infection. And so time will tell and we'll become smarter. So if we have this panel again in three or four or six months, you'll have better answers. We are learning, Nasia, I'd like you to address that, but we are learning a little bit where I just saw a headline right before we started this saying that uh, 89 people who have been vaccinated uh, have been infected with COVID-19 in Minnesota. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what we're learning there and, and what we're maybe worried about. Well, I think that there are a couple of things at play here. One is that sometimes when people come down with SARS-CoV-2 after getting vaccinated, uh, it's the timing of when they got the vaccine relative to when they got the infection. Uh, you just have to remember that it takes a good two weeks after getting the second dose of the vaccine for those two dose ones where you can be reasonably certain of having achieved that you know 90 percent plus protection uh, and so if you get an infection within that time frame it's likely that you were incubating it and the vaccine actually was not in time to, to help protect you against it now having said that there are certain cases 
of people who have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 after having been vaccinated several months ago and did come down with the infection. And I think that there's two potential explanations for it. One is that there is a variant strain that they came down with that evaded the vaccine, which we know is the case for some of these variant strains, although not for many of them. Uh, and the other is that for whatever reason, perhaps because they're immune compromised or have medical conditions, they didn't generate the level of immunity to the vaccine that would be expected to confer protection. So yes, these are wonderful vaccines, but even a 95% effective vaccine means, as, as Jonathan likes to say, that one in 20 people will still get the, will get the infection. So that's why we can't get rid of masks and distancing and some of the other measures just quite yet. And Ken, uh, if I can just chime in there, the, the other thing to note about that is that we, it looks like even the, those who get the infection after they've been vaccinated, it's not as severe as it would have, as it would have been in an unvaccinated population. So there's some protection offered for at least most of those people who are, who end up um, catching it anyway. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question to you, Malia. What, what would you like people to think about? What do you think is most important for people to think about as we look at the next five months? Someone brought up the five month period of time here. We're, you're really talking about the weather's getting nicer and people are getting antsy. What should be at the top of their mind? Well, I would say it's gonna take a little more patience before we get there. It is very, very exciting to see um, people in my local community with those vaccine selfies and, uh, you know, starting to see uh, the the possibility that I could actually see my friends in person pretty soon uh, with all of us vaccinated. But it is going to take a little more time before we're really there at the population level where we can, um, you know, abandon wearing masks in public, um, return to large gatherings. I have a lot of concern about um, people uh you know, we're all really tired. We're tired of doing this. And I have a lot of concern about people um, feeling like, well, I'm vaccinated. Most of my friends are vaccinated. We're dunsies. And then um, going back to their normal pre-pandemic practices, which could open the opportunity. You know, if we, if we all start doing that, things start feeling really normal, then even those who are at high risk, such as kids and people who, and adults who haven't been vaccinated yet, um, could actually be circulating disease uh, even more than, you know, a couple of months ago. We have these new variants going around, and um, I'm worried that we're kind of at a crux, you know, we're at a little bit of a, a fork in the road where we just need to stay the course a little bit longer before we really can feel safe. Michael Ferris, yeah, I'd like to give you the final word here. You shared some positive numbers with us before we started today. Yeah. Where do you see us? So one thing which, I, so I think there's a lot of optimism. There's a wonderful uh, dashboard or website uh, populated by the DHS, uh, COVID, uh, COVID uh, vaccination information. And so for one thing, it shows that within Wisconsin, we have uh, – vaccinated over 70% of the, uh, the 65 plus population. And so uh, there are vaccines around there which are getting into the right arms. And, and while the website talks about the racial, uh, racial and ethnic disparities, the fact that it's being published and people are understanding that we're thinking about those things is critical as we move forward. The great news is that every week my uh, model becomes more difficult to run because there are more people requesting uh, requesting vaccines and the supply is going up uh, uh, weekly. Uh, and so I, I learned this afternoon, in fact, that, that we had yet another, a second allocation of over 30,000 uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson or J&J uh, J &J, uh, vaccines uh, just came in today uh, that I have to go away right now and run the model to see uh, who will get these one and done uh, vaccines and, and vaccinate yet another uh, portion of our population. I think it, this is great. The, the effects of the vaccine uh, are way, way less in the, uh, than the, the consequences of the disease. So we will get this done uh, and hopefully everybody uh, becomes engaged in getting those jabs in their arms. Make Excellent. Hard. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 
Thank you all very much. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we've all learned a lot and, and the collaboration that's taking place on campus is evident. Um, so I think we all have a lot to be proud of as Wisconsin residents, as people who live in Madison, uh, as UW alums like I am, uh, that you know, on Wisconsin, uh, we're, we're, we're feeling great about the work that you're all doing. So, so thank you all very much for your dedication to not just your research and your work, but to communicating that with the rest of us. I think we'll throw it back to Laura here. No, we're not throwing it back to Laura. Okay, well, 